All right, good evening. Uh, happy Wednesday night. We're here for Bible study live from Antioch uh, Baptist Church in Scottsville, Virginia. We want to thank you in advance for, for tuning in and hope that you're doing well, that you're having a great day. Hope that you're having a good week. Uh, we know that it's still kind of touch and go for a lot of folks and, um, you know, depending on what you're watching, it's, you know, you, you, there's a lot of conflicting information out there, but uh, the good news is that what we're going to talk about tonight uh, is the truth. It is reliable. You can count on it. You can take it to the bank. So thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we're in the Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the of the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 18, and we're picking up tonight at verse 21. I'm going to go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have established your word above your name. I thank you that you watch over your word to perform it. I thank you, Lord, that as the rain falls from heaven and waters the ground, so is your word that goes forth from your mouth to accomplish whatever it is you set it out to accomplish. I thank you, O oh Lord, that your word does not return void. I thank you that it's alive and powerful. It's active. I thank you, O oh God, that whenever we read your word, your word reads us. So open our eyes, open our hearts to look into the pure word of God tonight. And uh, I thank you for this topic. Lord, give us the grace to apply it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Matthew chapter 18, we're in the fourth teaching section in in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, it contains five major teaching set sections throughout the Gospel, and this is the fourth. You remember the beginning of chapter 18, we were talking about church discipline, uh, humility, uh, being free from offenses, uh, how to uh, pray in agreement, to pray in agreement, to pray and seek God's will as a church. Uh, and so we talked about binding and loosing, and wherever two or three are gathered, he is there with us. So all of that had to do, uh, Jesus was preparing his disciples for, uh, preparing his disciples to run the church and the authority that they would have to establish the church on the earth. And, and so we talked about all that, the, 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 the pattern for handling uh, personal, interpersonal conflict uh, within the church and going one-on-one -on -one and then taking two or three and then if there's still no reconciliation to go before the church. So to, tonight we're going to talk about really a second a side of that coin in, in reconciliation and it's, it's forgiveness. It, if there's ever going to be reconciliation, there must be forgiveness. And to forgive someone simply means to let, to let them go, to let it go, not to hold whatever offense or sin or wrongdoing against their account. It's a very hard thing to do. Whenever we are hurt or wronged, uh, we, we, something within us demands justice. Something within us demands, at least at the very least, an apology. But if you've been on this earth for any amount of time, you'll know that sometimes bad things happen to good people and uh, bad people prosper and they don't say they're sorry when they hurt you. And uh, I'm sure we've all experienced some type of scenario where Somebody sinned against you, and now you either have to forgive them or you're going to hold it against them. And so Jesus is going to teach tonight about forgiveness. So starting in Matthew chapter 18, uh, verses 21, I'll read verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times could my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. So that's two questions there from Peter. Peter's first question, how many times do I got to forgive my brother who sins against me? And then is seven times enough? And uh, verse 22, uh, Jesus responds, I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus said to him, but 70 times seven. And other translations say 77 times. And so uh, first of all, just a little background. Uh, the Jewish rabbis uh, had a rule of thumb uh, they had the good old-fashioned three strikes and you're out rule. I know you know that, right? Three strikes and you're out. If you forgive someone, the, ra the Jewish rabbis would teach, if you forgive somebody three times uh, in sequence, hey, honey, good to see you. If you forgive somebody three times, in, that you've forgiven them enough, three strikes and you're out. If they, if, they, if they sin once, forgive them. Sin twice, forgive them. Sin three times, forgive them. After that, they're out. And so Peter thinks he's being super generous when he comes to Jesus and he says, how about seven times? Peter is stretching it beyond 
the religious and the cultural norm for forgiveness. So Peter is suggesting an improvement. When he says, I'll forgive him seven times, is seven times enough. He's suggesting a big improvement over even what the rabbis required. And so, uh, and Jesus comes at him. What Jesus does is Jesus tells him, nope, seven times isn't enough. Uh, try 70 times seven, or other translations say 77 times. Now, either number you take, the point is Jesus really did not mean that you can stop forgiving somebody after 490 times or after 77 times. What Jesus is implying here is that there should be no limit to our forgiveness of others. Uh, in the Interpreter's Bible, a study Bible that I read earlier today, it called this, uh, it called this celestial arithmetic. The 70 times 7 or the 77 times, it's celestial arithmetic. There, it's not a math problem that you have to do in your head. It's a math problem that you have to do in your heart. And this is where forgiveness happens. It happens right here. This is where you have to release from. Uh, you know, 490 times, 77 times, it, it, there's not, it, if you're keeping score, you're missing the point already. You have to do this heart arithmetic. You have to realize that there should be no limit in, in how much forgiveness that we extend. Peter thought he's being overly generous, uh, and Jesus counteracted his math, saying, no, Peter, that's not enough. There should be no limit. Now, Jesus uses a, a, a parable, which is just, a parable is just a story with a point, and he uses a parable to illustrate what he means. And so we'll keep reading and we'll read verses 23 through 35. And then I'm going to give us four, four little points on forgiveness tonight. So not, not, not seven times. Jesus says 70 times seven. Then in verse 23, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. That's a lot of money back in the day. Since he had no way to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he owned be sold to pay back the debt. At this, the slave fell face down before him and said, be patient with me, my Lord. I will repay you everything. Then the master of that slave had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. And that is a perfect picture of forgiveness. To, to forgive somebody means not to count a debt against their account. Every time somebody harms you, think, think in your mind of they owe you now a payment. They owe you now a payment of reconciliation. And to forgive them means that you forgive the debt. It would be like if you had a bill and you took that bill, set it on fire, and burned it up. That's, what, that's a good picture of what forgiveness is, to forgive somebody's debt against you. So, at verse 28, but the slave, so he gets forgiven this 10,000 talent loan. In, in other words, it was 6,000 denarii. Remember that word, denarii, 6,000 denarii. 100 denarii was about one day's wage. So this guy gets forgiven 10,000 talents or 6,000 denarii. Now look what he does in verse 28. But the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii. So he finds somebody that owes him 100 denarii. That is, that, I mean, he, he was just forgiven a 6,000 denarii debt. And what does he do right after that? He goes to somebody who owes him 100 denarii. He grabbed him and started choking him and said, pay me what you owe. At this, his fellow slave fell down and began begging him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he was not willing. On the contrary, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other slaves saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then, after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have also had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? That verse 33 is the key right there. Jesus, the king says to this servant, shouldn't you have had the same mercy that you received? Shouldn't you have forgiven your fellow slave just like I forgave you? At verse 34 says, and his master got angry and handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. 
so my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother or sister from his heart. Now that last verse there is huge. What Jesus says was, the same thing that happened to that wicked servant where he was handed over in jail to be tortured until he could repay his debt. Jesus says that same thing the Heavenly Father will do to you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Wow. Now, understand in this story, the master is Jesus. The first wicked servant is you and I. And the other servant is our fellow man and our neighbor. That first Wicked servant, you and I were forgiven that 10,000 talent debt, just like he was in the story. When we receive salvation, Jesus Christ pays the penalty for our sin. The Heavenly Father cleans off our slate. He wipes off our debt because Jesus Christ paid the penalty on the cross for your sin and for my sin. Our sin is that $10,000 debt, that 6,000 denarii debt, that when we fall on our faces and we say, Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins and I acknowledge you as Lord. When we do that, the Father applies the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross to our debt. And though our sins were red as scarlet, they become white as snow. That's salvation. That's forgiveness on a divine level. We have been forgiven the immense debt. Now, here's the thing. I think sometimes when it comes to forgiving others, we have a tendency to forget how serious your, your sin and my sin is. We forget how serious our sin was. And I want you to hear me tonight. Even if all you ever did was tell one little white lie in your whole life, which all of us have done worse than that. I've done worse than that. You've done worse than that. But if, even if all you, if the only sin you had ever committed was one little white lie, it still required Christ going to the cross to pay for it. That's how holy God is, and that's how serious sin is. We have been forgiven that huge debt. We have been, our sins have been erased. They have been cast into the sea of forgetfulness. We have been forgiven that huge debt. So how many times have we been like that wicked servant where we have been forgiven of our sins and we have received salvation and eternal life? And then we go out to a fellow slave, to another person, to our neighbor, to another well-being, and even though they, they owe us a hundred denarii debt, what, and we go and we choke them and we say, you, you have to pay me back, and we hold it against them and we refuse to forgive and we allow bitterness to consume our heart. Listen, point number one tonight is this. You need to forgive others as quickly as you want God to forgive you. Forgive others as quickly as you want God to forgive you. That's the moral of the story. Now, how many times have you and I been like that wicked servant? Even though we've been forgiven such a great debt, we hold the, the other offenses against people. And sometimes it may seem like it's a huge offense or a huge sin. And many times it could be. It could have caused extreme emotional damage. It could have caused extreme hurt and heartache. But no matter what sins have been committed against us, they, they pale in comparison to the sins that were forgiven by God. Listen, I want you to realize how serious our sin is and how holy our God is. Realize how much grace and mercy you have received and then forgive others as quickly as you want God to forgive you. That's what Jesus is saying to us in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That's the thing. If you do not forgive others, you cannot and should not expect God to forgive others. You. Now, praise God, he is divine and perfect, and he can forgive a whole lot better than we can. But he'll help us forgive. I want you to realize uh, something about forgiveness. This is a huge thing because the person that you need to forgive may not desire your forgiveness, and they probably don't deserve your forgiveness. I think that that's an important realization to come through when you're making the decision to forgive. The person that you're going to forgive or that you need to forgive, they may not desire it and they probably don't deserve it. But forgiveness, Jesus said at the end of that passage, you have to forgive from your heart. Forgiveness is a decision of the will. It's a decision of the will. You have to make it in your heart of hearts and then your emotion 
will eventually get in line. But you have to make that decision from your will. I have to choose. I'm going to forgive you because of what you've done. We've got to let it go because God commands us to forgive. And so the, the offender may not desire forgiveness. Uh, even if we forgive them, listen to me, they may never change. They may never change. They may never make it right. But that doesn't negate our responsibility to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. That's what Ephesians chapter 4 says. To forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. The offender, the person uh, that, that, that we have that against, may not seek reconciliation. Uh, but we can still make that decision to forgive. We need to let it go. Because it's not about them. It's about, it's about experiencing our own freedom. When you choose to forgive and cancel out those debts, what you're doing is, is you're letting yourself be free. You're setting yourself free. All right, point number one, forgive others as quickly as you want God to forgive you. Now, I don't know about you, but I need God to forgive me multiple times a day, every day, and I need him to forgive me now. Like, Lord, forgive me now, every day I pray that, that he would forgive me. And it's not because I'm afraid I'm going to lose my salvation with him. It's because I know. This is why I ask for forgiveness every day. I don't need to ask for forgiveness every day as a condition of my salvation. I ask God for forgiveness every day because I know that I've probably done something that broke his heart. I know how serious sin is, and I don't want to do anything that displeases him because he loves me, and because he loves me, I love him. And I want to live a life worthy of the calling that I've received. So I ask for forgiveness multiple times a day. And I need to ask for forgiveness from other people multiple times a day. i got to ask my wife to forgive me two or three times an hour sometimes. And so I want her to forgive me quickly, so I'm going to forgive her quickly, and I want God to forgive me quickly. So I'm going to be quick to extend mercy to others. If you are quick to extend mercy to others, what you will find is that you will live a life free of bitterness and resentment. There's nothing worse than holding on to bitterness and resentment. They will rot your bones from the inside out. When you hold on to that wrongdoing and you refuse, when you go like that wicked servant did to the fellow slave and you hold him and you say, pay me what you owe. When you hold that in your heart, what you do is you rot your own spiritual life. Your spiritual life begins to decay. It hinders your relationship with God. It hinders your ability to pray. It hinders your ability to love others. You start, you start mistreating everybody else. You start hurting people that didn't even do anything to you. Why? Because you're holding on to an offense, to a sin that somebody else committed. You start taking it out on people that didn't even do anything to you. You don't want to live like that. Forgive others as quickly as you expect God to forgive you. Now, I love what Bryant McGill says, and this is a long point, but this is my, my second point. Because they caused, the person who hurt you or sinned against you, they caused the first wound, but as long as you hold on to unforgiveness, you cause the rest of your wounds. They may have caused the first wound, but as long as you hold on to unforgiveness, you cause the rest of your wounds. It's no longer on them. It's now on you because you refuse to forgive the debt. This is not what forgiving does. Listen, somebody else may have got it started, but if you don't forgive, you keep it going. You keep the hurt cycling over and over. You have to forgive and let it go or it's going to eat you alive. You think that uh, they made you feel this way. But when you will not forgive, remember that you are the one inflicting pain upon yourself. You may think it's somebody else's fault, but every moment you refuse to forgive, you're inflicting pain upon yourself. I remember the story of a little boy who was sitting on a bench and an old man is walking in the park and the old man is walking up and he sees this little boy sitting on the bench and the little boy is very uncomfortable. He looks like he's in pain. And the old man said, son, what's wrong? Why? What's wrong with you? And the little boy says, well, I'm sitting on a bee and the bee keeps stinging me. And so the old man says, well, son, why don't you get up and let that bee go? And this is what the little boy said. He says, well, because I think I'm hurting it a whole lot more than it's hurting me. And the man just shrugged. He said, no, son, you're not hurting that bee anymore. That bee is going to keep hurting you. Get up and let it go. And when it comes to unforgiveness, we're like that little boy sitting on the bee. We will sit on it and we will think, well, I'm hurting them a whole lot more. By withholding forgiveness from them, I'm actually winning in this situation. No, you're not. 
You're just inflicting pain upon yourself. Get up and let it go. Don't let it eat you alive. They caused the first wound. If you refuse to forgive, you cause every wound after that. So don't live in that cycle. You got to break the cycle. Realize what a great debt you've been forgiven. And now use that joy and that gratitude to break the other little debts. Point number three, when you choose to forgive those who have hurt you, you take away their power. When you choose to forgive those who have hurt you, you take away their power. And I listen, I'm talking about serious hurts now. I'm talking about abuse. I'm talking about emotional, physical. I'm talking about betrayal. I'm talking about they stabbed you in the back. They hurt you physically. They hurt you in ways that nobody should have ever hurt you. But listen, when you choose to forgive those who have hurt you, you take away their power. It no longer has power over you. It no longer determines your future. It no longer ruins your present. You cannot live in the past. You have to have the past in your life, just like you have a rear view mirror in your car. Every now and then you glance up, but you don't drive looking in the rear view mirror. If you do, guess what? You're going to wreck. You have to remember the past. You have to learn from the past, but you cannot let the past keep you in a cycle of depression and hurt. When you choose to forgive those who hurt you, you release their power. They no longer have any power over your life. And this brings up an important question because you hear it all the time, right? When I say forgive, I'm surprised somebody hasn't put it in the comments yet. Forgive and forget. Well, should we forgive and forget? Is that what I'm saying? Well, listen, forgive and forget is not actually in the scripture. Forget, that, that, that is not in, in the Bible, forgive and forget. But listen, if forgive and forget, if, if by that you mean that you're going to choose to forgive whoever hurt you for the sake of Christ and move on with your life, then it's godly and wise counsel. We should forgive others just as in Christ God forgave others. Us And we cannot allow, Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 15 says, we cannot allow, hey Randy, what's up? We cannot allow a root of bitterness to spring up in our hearts. But listen, if by forgive and forget you mean that you're going to act as if uh, the sin never occurred and you're going to live as if you don't remember it, and you, you have to be careful that you don't put yourself back into a harmful or abusive situation. When we say to forgive and forget, we don't mean to neglect wisdom, and, to re and that doesn't mean that we can't remove ourselves from harmful, abusive relationships. There are some people that you just do not need in your life. You can forgive them, and you can live without holding that sin against them, but it does not mean that you need to continue to put yourself in a position. Please hear me. Don't continue to put yourself in a position where you're going to continuously uh, surrender yourself to the to the same ongoing abuse day after day after day. That's not a healthy environment. You can forgive and you can move on, but don't 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 forget in the sense that you're going to act like it never happened. That's not what forgiveness really means. It doesn't mean that you're at, you're not acting like it never happened. It means that you're no longer allowing it to affect your everyday life. It means that you're no longer going to live in this moment. Like, like, that, like that hurt is the shadow coming over you in every moment of your life. No, you're going to forgive. You're going to turn it over to the Lord. But sometimes you need to remember because you can't see their heart. Only God can see their heart. So you need to be wise in some instances. And uh, forgiving, and, and it doesn't mean that you're always going to hold that against them. It doesn't mean that you're always going to hold that over their head. It just means that you're going to be cautious and not put yourself back in an abusive situation. So I really want to make that clarity. Do not, forgiving and forgetting means in the sense of, yes, I'm going to continue to move forward and walk in freedom. Yes, do that. But do not think that God wants you to continuously subject yourself to ongoing abuse. That's not what God wants for you. He wants to protect you. And so remember what Proverbs chapter 22 verse 3 says. I love this proverb and it's a great balance. God wants us to have balance. And Proverbs 22 verse 3 says that the prudent see danger and take refuge. The wise see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep on going and pay the penalty. Listen, God doesn't want you to be dumb. Walk in wisdom. And understand this. Please understand this. 
Forgiveness involves not holding a sin against a person any longer, but forgiveness is not the same thing as trust. Forgiveness and trust are two separate things. So when we give forgiveness, we should give forgiveness unconditionally. But we do have to be wise in who we trust. And we do have to be wise in who we put ourselves in relationship with. So it may be that you need to forgive. It's ideal to forgive and forget. But there may be circumstances where you do need to forgive and then you need to take a step back and just be wise. And, uh, and let the Lord teach you. Because God can see their heart, but you can't. I love what the Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 10. It says that God has not dealt with us as our sins deserve. I love that verse. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our offenses. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love towards those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, uh, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. Man, thank God. I remember the story of an old church woman that that was, uh, that was discipling this young lady, and the young lady came to her, and she said, hey, does the devil ever bring up your past sins and try to make you guilty, make you feel guilty? And the, and the older lady said, yeah, he does. He comes, you know, there's times when he tries to bring up my past and tries to hang me up. And, uh, and, and so the young lady asked the, asked the mentor, she said, well, what do you tell him? She says, whenever the devil comes to me and tries to remind me of a past sin that God's already forgiven me for, I just tell him to go to the east. I tell him to go to the east in Jesus' name. And she says, well, what do you do when he gets back? She says, well, when he comes back, I tell him to go to the west. In Jesus' name, I tell him to go to the west. Because that's how far apart Jesus has thrown. God has cast my sins as far away as the east is from the west. The beautiful thing is that the east and the west never touch each other. They're never going to meet again. And here's the thing. God's all-knowing. God's all-knowing. So when it says that he has forgotten, it means that he has chosen not to remember it. God, as a decision of his will, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he says, I am going to choose to apply the perfect sacrifice of my son to your life, and I'm no longer going to count your transgressions against you. I'm not going to deal with you as your transgressions observe, because as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love for us. I hope that you can rest and live in the forgiveness of God, in the faithfulness of God. Here's, here's, here's what I know. You will never begin to appreciate the faithfulness of God until you embrace the forgiveness of God. you got to accept it. He has forgiven us. And that's not a license to keep on sinning. When you really understand it, what you'll realize is, my life was so much better without that junk. Thank you, God, for forgiving me, and I'm not going to return to it. I'm going to follow you instead. So that's point number, point number three. When you choose to forgive those who have hurt you, you take away their power. And our last point tonight, point number four, forgiveness does not change the past. This is a, a, Paul, a Paul Booth quote. I like this quote. Forgiveness does not change the past, but it does enlarge the future. And I love that. Forgiveness does not change the past, but it does enlarge the future. It's important to remember. I want listen to me. I want you to hear me on this. When you forgive someone from for hurting you, it does not make what they did to you okay. It does not justify their sin. It does not justify what they said or did. It does not make it okay. When you forgive someone for hurting you, you are not saying what you, ha what you did to me was, was licensed. What you did to me was good. What you did to me was justified. That's not what it means. When you forgive someone, it doesn't make what happened okay. It just means that you have found the strength to overcome it and to move beyond it. You are setting yourself free by releasing the wrong. So I think a lot of times people think, well, I don't want to forgive them because what they did was so wrong. Yeah, when you forgive, you're not saying that what they did was right. When you forgive, what you're saying is, you know what? I'm going to find strength to get past this. Because no matter how horrible it was, it hasn't stopped you yet. It hasn't killed you yet. You can find the strength to overcome and to move beyond it. Remember how God forgave you and extend that same mercy to them. And listen, 70 times 7, you have to understand something that Forgiving somebody 
It doesn't mean that what they did was okay. It means you found the strength to overcome it. Also, forgiving somebody doesn't mean that you're never going to deal with it again. It doesn't mean that it's never going to come up again. That's why you got to forgive 70 times 7 because it may come up again. The situation may come up. You may be in the type of scenario where you have to be in touch or communication or you have to see this person. You have to come into contact. We live in a small community in a small town. There's only so many places you can go and run and hide. Listen, I'm telling you, that does not mean when you forgive somebody... It doesn't mean that you're never going to have to deal with it again. It may, came, it may come up again. It may pop into your mind again. Yeah, somebody else may bring it up. Somebody else may ask you about it. So what do you have to do? you got to forgive them again. 70 times 7. I'm going to forgive them again. I'm going to forgive them again. I'm going to release it again. Whenever somebody throws it at you, you throw it right back at the cross. Whenever it comes up, you take it right back to the cross. You mentally, in your mind, you're going to have to say over and over and over and over again, Lord, I have given this to you. I forgive so-and-so. I bless so-and-so. And I release them into your hands. And I refuse, I refuse to allow that root of bitterness to take hold in my life. You may have to do that a hundred million times a year. You may, hopefully you don't have to do it that much, but you may have to do it a lot. But that's why Jesus said 70 times 7, because it's going to come up again. I remember we had a situation in this church where there, there are people that come and fellowship in this church that by all human standards should never have contact with each other. But you know what they both did? They forgave. They forgave. And I remember talking to one who said, I understand now why Jesus told me I'm going to have to forgive 70 times 7, because it, every time I see that person, Every time I see that person, every time I see uh, somebody related to that person or a friend of that person, you know what? The devil tries to, bring, it tries to creep back up in my heart and in my mind, and I have to forgive him again. Listen, forgive as many times as the Lord has forgiven you because forgiveness doesn't change the past. It doesn't uh, qualify the past, but it does enlarge your future. And if you're going to walk in freedom, you're going to have to learn to walk in forgiveness. You know why? Because... Just as many other wicked servants, like in this story, just as many other wicked servants uh, owe you a debt, guess what? You probably owe a few debts yourself. You probably said a few things or, 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 or you know, you probably done a few things where you need to be forgiven as well. And so remember that if, if you want others to forgive you, if you want others to have grace for you, you need to have grace for other people. Don't be like that kind of person that is always holding on to sin and offense. And don't just don't be that person. Give it back to God. Remember that when we owed him that huge debt that we could not pay, we fell on our knees and we cried out to Jesus and he forgave us. Remember that any time you have to forgive somebody else. And no matter how many times you have to forgive them. Think about how many times God's forgiven you. Can you even count them? I can't even count them. I can't even count how many times God's forgiven me, but I'm so grateful that he does. I want to ask you a couple questions in closing tonight. Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to forgive? Is there anybody in your heart, in your mind, that you just need to release them, release the situation, forgive them, and, and just tell the Lord, I forgive so-and-so for this? And it may be a situation where, and is there anybody who may need to forgive you? And I want to give you, listen, ask for forgiveness to God alone. And I love uh, Celebrate Recovery has this rule of thumb, and I love it. If, if the situation would be too painful uh, to go to them directly, if you would hurt them too, too much by going to them directly, then you know what? Just go to God with it and release it from your heart. There's going to be some situations where, uh, you need to forgive somebody, but that doesn't mean you need to see them again. Just forgive them between you and God and wish them well and move on with your life. If it's going to cause more harm than good, then just take it between you and the Lord. Write a letter, do something uh, harmless. On the, just like this wicked servant did, I want to close with this. There's going to be a day when every human being on the planet has to settle accounts with King Jesus. There's going to be a day where you and I, we've got to settle our accounts with Jesus. We're going to stand before him. And I pray that if you have never received the forgiveness of your sins, fall on your knees today, 
repent and ask. This is what 1 John 1, 9 says. It says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The only chance they vote has got when I stand before God, the only thing I can say, this is what I'm going to say, Lord, I don't deserve to be here. That's what I'm going to tell God. I don't deserve to be here. But what I did was I put my faith and my trust in what Jesus did for me on the cross. And that's the only reason why I deserve anything from you, Lord. And you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, come here, son. I welcome you. That's the only chance I've got. Is I'm banking on the grace and the mercy of God. I'm living my life in light of that forgiveness. And because I'm trying to do that, you know what I'm doing? I'm forgiving others when they hurt me. When I got to settle accounts, I'm telling you, there is no way the good deeds that I've done are going to even come close to balancing out the evil that I've done. The only chance I've got is falling on my knees and saying, Lord, you've got to forgive me. I beg you for mercy. If you've never done that, I pray that you will. And every time somebody else hurts you, I want you to think about that day when you've got to settle the account with God. When you, when, when you have to give an account for the words you've said, for the way you've spent your time, for the way you've spent your money. Listen, if you've put your faith and hope and trust in Jesus, that day is going to be a day of rejoicing. That day is going to be a day of celebration because you're going to receive the grace of God, even when you knew you didn't deserve it. Think about how many times you need God to forgive you and choose to forgive others. Remember, forgive others as quickly as you expect God to forgive you. It's a decision of the will. It's a choice that you have to make. We have to forgive. And remember that if you refuse to forgive somebody for the sins that they've done against you, they may have caused the first wound, but by refusing to forgive them, you cause every wound after that. You've got to let it go. And when you choose to forgive others, you release the power that that sin had over you. You are set free from it. So forgive and move on. And while forgiveness doesn't change the past, it does enlarge the future. And I hope that your future days will be days where you extend forgiveness and receive forgiveness from God. I'm going to close with what C.S. Lewis said. He says, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable in others because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable in others because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Thanks be to God that we're set free because of what Jesus did. We're forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness, clothed now in his righteousness. So from this point on, let's be like a humble, grateful servant. And remember that we've been forgiven such a great debt. Let's turn around and let's forgive others so that we can pray, Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive those that have debts against us, as we forgive our debtors. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you forgave the inexcusable in us. We thank you, O oh God, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how you demonstrated love and you demonstrated forgiveness for us. So Lord, help us to forgive others just as in Christ God forgave us. Lord, help us, O oh Lord, to remember that we have no right to expect forgiveness from you if we refuse to extend forgiveness to others. We have no right to accept forgiveness from you or expect forgiveness from you if we don't extend forgiveness to others. And I just pray for the supernatural ability to do this. I pray that your Holy Spirit will empower people because I know that there have been hard things, harsh things, hurtful things said and done. But Lord, help us to remember that we can let that go and it does not have to, to have an impact on our present day and on our future day. Lord, I pray you help us to live with the past, Lord, uh, as something that we celebrate your grace has restored instead of letting it be a stumbling block for what you want us to do today. Give us the strength and the power to forgive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Love y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, see you tomorrow night. Going to go live at 5 again tomorrow night. And uh, take care. God bless you.